Good afternoon. My name is Edna Navarro Vidalre, Assistant Director of Community Systems Development. On behalf of Illinois Action for Children and the Consortium for Community Systems Development, I would like to welcome you to today's webinar titled Infant and Early Childhood Mental Health. To get us started, here are some basic housekeeping tips. This session is being recorded and will be available on our Partner Plan Act website for future viewing. At this time, all of the participants have been muted. Please feel free to submit your questions throughout the presentation into the questions chat box. If we are unable to get to all of your questions during the webinar, we will send a follow-up email with all of the questions answered. Also, please note that the handout, um, the webinar slides, are attached um, in the dashboard and you can download and save them for later. Finally, if you encounter any technical issues, please either use the chat box to send us a message or email Mercedes Gonzalez at Mercedes Gonzalez at actforchildren.org. At this time, we'd like to um, learn who's on our call today. Um, so we will um, take a couple moments just to launch um, three polls. So um, our first poll is to um, learn who, um, wh who, what your role is. Um, so are you a early childhood provider? Are you a collaboration leader? Are you a cross-sector partner um, working in the health or social service um, sectors? Are you a state leader? or do you fall under other? And if under other, please use the chat box to enter your information. Great, just a couple more seconds. We have about 82% of you that have submitted your response. A few more seconds. Okay, so I think we have about 30% uh, of you that have said that you're an early childhood provider, 11% uh, of you who said you're a co collaboration leader, 15% of you said you're a cross-sector partner, either in the health, social service, or other fields, 5% of you have said you're a state leader, and there's about 39% of you that have said that you fall under other. All right, now that we know uh, what your role is, we'd love to hear uh, where you are from. Um, so we'd like to know if you are in the southern region of the state, the central region, the northern region, and a little bit more specific if you are in the Cook County area. So if you can take a moment to uh, submit your answer in the poll, we'd appreciate it.
Great. So we have 7% uh, of you are from the southern region, 31% of you are from the central region, 24% are from the northern region, and just a little bit more um, uh, specific results in the Cook County area, we've got about 38% of you. Thank you so much. We've got one more, and then we will get to our presentation. Great. So the next question is, um, what is your knowledge level of on the topic of infant and early childhood mental health. Sorry, if we have a typo. It's supposed to be what is your familiarity. Um, so if you could put um, one, not familiar, two, somewhat familiar, and three, um, very familiar. Great, so uh, looks like a lot of you are uh, somewhat familiar, it's about 18% not familiar and 21% that's very familiar. Great, thank you so much for participating in our polls. This is helpful to know who is in our audience. And so um, at this time, we would like to um, present, uh, we'd like to introduce you to today's presenter, Allison Lowe Photos, uh, Policy Manager with the Ounce of Prevention Fund, she works on mental health, special education, preschool expulsion and suspension, and workforce development initiatives and issues at the OUNCE, and has been previously um, working in direct practice in early childhood education programs, providing case management, family support work, therapy with children and families, infant early childhood mental health consultation, and supervising a teen parent um, home visiting program. She also has international experience working in programs and projects in China, Mexico, and Turkey. Allison has a BS in psychology from the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill and an MSW from Loyola University, Chicago. Welcome, Allison. Hi, okay, Allison, thanks, everyone. Edna, can you, can you hear me now? Yep, we're all good. Great. And I just want to make sure you can see my screen. Uh, yep, we can see your screen. If you just want to make it um, from the current slide, there you go. All and, right. Um, your top, the top right-hand corner, there's that little box to make it a full screen. No worries. Is that it? Yep, I think you're good. Go ahead. Okay, perfect. Thanks everyone for bearing with us. Um, I'm happy to be here today and as Edna said, um, I'm a policy manager at the OUNCE and my background is in clinical social work, um, working directly with kids and families in early childhood programs before making the switch over to policy at the OUNCE about three years ago. Um, and I really feel like my direct client work helps inform my macro policy work, and that's why I'm also always happy to still stay in touch with programs in the field and parents and kids and families, um, just to make sure that we're all informing each other and I'm hearing what's happening out there, and um, that way we can best inform policy. And I saw from the poll results that um, a pretty good chunk of you had no at least some things about infant and early childhood mental health, which is great. Um, and so I'm hoping that I won't be too repetitive and for even those who know a lot about it, we'll maybe learn a little bit something more. <clears throat> and so today we want to do an overview of what exactly is infant and early childhood mental health, talk about some best practices, and then of course uh, share some resources. All right, Edna, it is not letting me advance my screen. There it goes. Okay, and so just a few of the objectives about uh, what you'll learn today. Hopefully you'll be able to define the topic, learn some statistics, um, learn some signs and contributing factors, 
learn about specific topics such as trauma and early childhood expulsion, um, learn about ways to address it within programs, learn about some professional development supports, and then some statewide initiatives and legislation that are focusing on infant and early childhood mental health. So what exactly is infant and early childhood mental health? Uh, the organization Zero to Three defines it as the developing capacity of the child from birth to age five to form close and secure adult and peer relationships, experience, manage, and express a full range of emotions, and explore the environment and learn all in the context of family, community, and culture. So excellent emotional skills, which provide a strong foundation for emerging and cognitive abilities, are built in the earliest years and provide a foundation for success in school, the workplace, and the community. When we talk about infant and early childhood mental health, we like to frame our discussions from a strength-based perspective. Um, I think one of the biggest problems in mental health is reducing the stigma around it. And to do that, we really need to view it as mental health, not illness. Mental health is just as important as physical health. It's about taking care of yourself. It's normal. We go to the doctor for regular physical health and regular checkups, but no one really talks about mental health in this way. And so we need to focus on prevention with mental health just as much as in the physical health. However, it is important to acknowledge when there are bigger issues and, and very young children can have mental health diagnoses. So the Department of Health and Human Services estimates that one in five children aged birth to 18 has a diagnosable mental health disorder. Um, there's also the Diagnostic Classification of Mental Health Disorders in Infancy and Early Childhood, short, which is shortly known as the DC-0-5, to and this is like the DSM for young children. The DSM is for adults, and the DS DC 0 to 5 is the diagnostic manual for kids uh, 0 to 5. Um, the onset of major mental illness may occur as early as 6 years old, and recent studies have found that children can be depressed as young as age 3. A study published in the journal of the American Medical Association of Psychiatry states that depression in preschool results in changes in cortical gray matter development in the brain, and this area is important for emotion regulation. So what do mental health issues look like in infant, toddler or, uh, in, in infant or toddler or preschooler? So there are things such as changes in feeding, toileting, and sleeping habits, externalizing behavior problems such as biting or tantrums and aggression. There are internalizing behavior problems such as withdrawals and fearfulness and anxiety. And then there are regressions to earlier stages of development. Trauma symptoms can also present as challenging behaviors and manifest differently to an outside observer. So research has shown that trauma and extreme stress in childhood can lead to detrimental changes in actual brain structure and function. Activation of the body's stress response releases brain-changing hormones and chemicals into the system. And while experiencing some level of optimal stress, such as the first day of school, that can be really helpful and important. However, sustained and ongoing stress that is overwhelming is called toxic stress, and it can have damaging effects, particularly if it occurs during a sensitive developmental period. Exposure to toxic stress can actually modify a person's DNA and ultimately lead to handing down those modifications to future generations. And this is called intergenerational trauma. There's also historical trauma, where children are socialized to expect how we live with trauma, which gets passed down by generations. So, for instance, things like the Holocaust or institutional racism can lead to historical trauma. Children suffering from trauma arrive at school less engaged and less ready to learn than their peers. It can diminish concentration, memory, and the organizational and language abilities that children need to function well at school. Trauma can also lead children to be more at risk for delinquency due to a learned distrust and disregard for adults, rules, and laws. However, toxic stress and trauma isn't that the child has a disorder or brain damage, it's just that their brains and their connections don't mature like others and so they respond differently. Infant and early childhood mental health is also all about attachment and relationships. An infant or a toddler or a preschooler, they don't live in a bubble, and so anything that impacts that family also impacts the child. And so the mental health of the family and the caregivers are just as important as within the individual child. A 2013 Northwestern study showed that one in every seven women have significant depressive symptoms postpartum, and maternal depression has been linked to higher levels of both internalizing and externalizing behavior problems in children in early childhood. And this can lead to expulsion from preschool and child care, poor academic achievement, and lower graduation rates. Studies also suggest that 
anywhere from 4 to 25 percent of fathers experience paternal postpartum depression. And research shows that the father is at risk if the mother is also suffering from postpartum herself. And 71% of Illinois early care and learning providers indicated that family mental health concerns versus a child's mental health concerns were the most difficult for their program to address. Other factors that contribute to mental health issues in children are things like household disorganization. So frequent moves and family violence in early childhood were predictive of worse cognitive and social outcomes at approximately age five. However, these outcomes were actually bettered when children were attending greater childcare hours. <clears throat> Poverty is also a contributing factor. 57% of children and youth with mental health problems come from households living at or below the federal poverty level. And then lower social cohesion among neighbors and higher crime rates contribute to higher rates of psychotic symptoms among urban children. And overall, mental health services are pretty limited. Um, 75 to 80 percent of children and youth in need of mental health services actually do not receive them. And even within <clears throat> this number, there are particular disparities in access to mental health services among certain groups. So studies have shown that black and Hispanic children and young adults' receipt of mental health and substance abuse care were about half of those of non-Hispanic whites for all types and definitions of outpatient mental health services. Another study from the University of California found that while a higher percentage of black and Hispanic children show the symptoms of ADHD than white children, they are less likely to be diagnosed or treated for the disorder, as well as differences within the use of medication. Psychiatric and behavioral problems among minority youth often result in school punishment or incarceration, but rarely in mental health care. And there are various reasons for this. It could be bias among providers. Um, it could be that different communities may attach greater stigma about mental health care, or they may place less trust in the doctors available. And also, there's a shortage of professionals across the country, um, and black and Hispanic families often live in the most underserved areas. And in the context of infant and early childhood mental health, the differences in how we interpret a child's behavior and how we respond lead us to the issue of early childhood expulsion and suspension. So studies have shown that expulsion of children in early childhood settings is occurring at alarmingly high rates, in particular among certain racial and gender groups. This phenomenon is particularly troubling given that research suggests that school expulsion and suspension practices are associated with negative educational and life outcomes. A nationwide study in 2005 indicated that Illinois preschoolers were expelled at a rate three times higher than that of their older peers in kindergarten through 12th grade. And in 2002, an even earlier study was conducted in Chicago within child care programs and found a high rate of expulsion there, particularly with infants and toddlers. Um, over 40% of child care programs asked a child to leave because of social, emotional, and behavioral problems, with the most challenging behaviors listed as biting, hitting, and aggressive behavior. And if any of you know any infants and toddlers, that's pretty developmentally appropriate for that age, um, but they were still getting expelled. So even more alarming is that early childhood expulsion and suspension are occurring at high rates in certain racial and gender groups. It's most likely occurring in minority boys. And according to the Office of Civil Rights data, while boy, boys make up 54% of preschool enrollment, they represent 78% of preschoolers receiving one or more out-of-school suspensions. And more recent data has shown an increase for black girls also. So while black girls represent 54% of female preschool children receiving one or more out-of-school suspensions, only, um, they only represent 20% of the female preschool enrollment overall. So of course, for these reasons, it's very important to address the issue of early childhood expulsion. Um, early learning is important, and any time out of the classroom is detrimental to child outcomes. Um, and we've already talked about how there are higher rates in preschool than in K through 12. And expulsion in preschool actually predicts expulsion in later grades. And there's no research or data that supports the effectiveness of expulsion and suspension. So descriptive studies of school discipline have found that it doesn't actually reduce the misbehavior. And to me, equity is the most important argument for removing expulsion and suspension practices. The disparities within the numbers just mean that we're leaving behind specific groups, which is unacceptable.
So for all the reasons that we just outlined, um, you know, mental health issues in children, mental health issues in families, trauma, early childhood expulsion, it's really important that we address mental health issues within our early childhood programs. Mental health promotion, intervention, and treatment are important for all children. And what's important to remember is that even if a child is at risk, it doesn't mean that they will necessarily always develop problems. So while in general to toxic stress can lead to poor mental health, not every child exposed to it will suffer those consequences. The concept of resilience or coping effectively is best seen as a response to a specific situation and not as a constant trait. Uh, resilience is different for each child. It's fluid and it can change over time and what works in one situation might not work in another. And then it's important to remember that for those children who do need additional services that we in the early learning sector need to be appropriately prepared to identify and refer and connect them to services. So as experts try to bolster the mental health system, um, both to improve access across the board, but also to close race-based gaps, we need to use a multi-pronged approach, pulling in different kinds of caregivers than those who might normally treat mental health problems. So how do you address mental health within an early childhood program? Uh, well, a key indicator of high quality program is comprehensive services provided to kids and their families, one component of which is mental health services. Administrators really have to champion these mental health value, infant and early childhood mental health values from the top down and at all levels and make it a priority within your program. Uh, programs can actually set aside line items in their funding streams related to mental health and services as well as supports and professional development for staff. Addressing mental health is placing a focus on social emotional learning and the development of social emotional skills for all children. And following the Illinois Early Learning Guidelines and using a specific social emotional learning curriculum are examples of how to do this. You may also implement a tiered system of support, such as the pyramid model, which I'll t talk about a little bit later. Um, you can also address it within training, professional development, and supports for staff, which we'll talk about. Um, it's about developmental screening for all children, and we'll talk about that a little further, as well as parental screening and services, such as conducting family assessments, depression screening, referring out for services, and having community partnerships. And then finally, it's about infant and early childhood mental health consultation, which I'll also describe. So a tiered system of supports is generally divided into three parts. Um, first, you would have the universal promotional preventive level, and then you would have the intervention or targeted level for at-risk groups, and then finally the intensive and treatment level for individuals. So things like positive behavioral intervention and supports, or PBIS, and the pyramid model provide a framework for a tiered system of supports. So the pyramid model for promoting social emotional competence in infants and young children is an intervention and support framework early educators can use to promote young children's social and emotional development and prevent and address challenging behavior. It was developed by the Center for the Social and Emotional Foundations for Early Learning and the Technical Assistance Center on Social Emotional Intervention. So the different tiers contain the yellow foundation, which is the foundation for all of the practices in the pyramid and the systems and policies necessary to ensure a workforce that's able to adopt and sustain these evidence-based practices. Then you have your blue tier, which is the universal supports for all children through nurturing and responsive relationships and high quality environments. Your green tier, which is prevention and represents the practices that are targeted social emotional strategies to prevent problems. And then finally your red tier, which is intervention, and that's the practices related to individualized intensive interventions. And though initially more time consuming, school-wide social emotional programs and tiered systems of support are actually proving to be more cost effective and promising alternatives that have short and long-term impact for student schools and their communities. There's also a need for training and professional development for staff. And so training topics include things like promoting social emotional development and behavioral health, addressing challenging behaviors, understanding trauma and trauma-informed care, cultural humility or competence, and so cultural humility is the ability to maintain an interpersonal stance that is other-oriented or open to the other in relation to aspects of cultural identity that are the most important to the person. Cultural competence is having an awareness of one's own cultural identity and views about difference and the ability to learn and build on the varying cultural and community norms of students and their families. It's the ability to understand the within-group differences that make each student unique while celebrating the between-group differences that make our country a tapestry. 
Another training topic is the use of reflective practice techniques. And so reflective practice is the ability to reflect on one's actions so as to engage in a process of continuous learning. Um, a key rationale for this practice is that experience alone does not necessarily lead to learning, but deliberate reflection on experience is essential. Another topic that would be important to know about is preschool expulsion and suspension. So just knowing about the issue um, is important and to be able to address it. And also recognizing and addressing implicit bias and microaggressions. Family engagement, including how to have difficult conversations, is another important training topic. And then how to make referrals and evaluate for services. Training overall is really important, not only for that direct staff, so your teachers, your home visitors, but also for indirect and supervisory staff as well. Um, supervisors and administrators should receive training on all the topics that I've talked about, but also how to provide reflective supervision, how to communicate with families, how to have difficult conversations. Um, because you're going to have to talk, to have difficult conversations with either your staff and reflection, but also with families. Um, for instance, if you have a child who scores a concern on a screening, you'd have to have a hard conversation with a family, perhaps. Um, or you may have to talk to the other families in that classroom if there's one particular child who is exhibiting challenging behaviors. And so training should also be both pre-service and ongoing. And so before you get into the field, but also once you're in the field, it's really important to have continuous ongoing support. And so things that are continuous and ongoing are things like coaching and consultation. Um, it's not enough to just you know, attend one training. A lot of times we do need to hear things multiple times before we actually can put it into practice or remember it. And so coaching and consultation can kind of help with this, but also the consultation can really help with that reflective piece. Um, there's also a need for supportive practices for staff. It's not just about training. Um, it's about things like adequate break time, adequate compensation, and access to mental health and stress management resources. Um, teacher job stress and depression have been linked to um, higher expulsion rates. And um, we all know that our teachers have a very hard job. Uh, we ask them to do a lot of things and take care of um, our most precious assets. And we also ask them to know a lot of things and be very well educated. Um, and yet we don't pay them high enough. Um, and we also you know, don't give them as many supports as they need. And so if you're very stressed out, um, you're not going to be able to attune as well to the, the kids in your classroom. Um, another professional development and support for staff, we have a few different things here in Illinois. There's the Infant Mental Health Certificate Program at, Eric's, at the Erickson Institute. Um, that institute is here in Chicago, but I do know that they are uh, trying to plan out some more distance learning opportunities in the future so that people from other parts of the state can access that. The Illinois Association for Infant Mental Health also has a master's level credential in infant mental health. And they're currently uh, working on a bachelor's level, which I'll talk about later. Um, they also have an annual conference. And the upcoming one is October 20th. Um, and you can go on their website and register. This year's topic is the Neuro-Relational Framework for Translating Brain Science into Clinical Practice. And that's Dr. Connie Lilas, who will be our keynote speaker. There are also reflective learning and practice groups for infant mental health consultants through the Illinois Children's Mental Health Partnership and the, and the Ounce of Prevention Fund. And then also for any practitioner, not just consultants, um, there are reflective practice groups through the Illinois Association for Infant Mental Health. So another way to address infant and early childhood mental health in your program is through developmental screening. So it's important to not only to screen kids as they have behavioral problems, but if you really want to take a truly preventative approach, you would want to do universal screening of all children. And so developmental screenings, when they're done properly, they can also serve as a really important family engagement tool that opens up discussions between a caregiver and a provider. Because it's not just about identifying concerns, it's also about what the child is doing well. But this topic is one that I often hear providers and programs really struggle with, um, not just how to do screening, but also in particular how to have those difficult conversations with family if a concern does come up. And so that's why professional development and support for staff around this issue is important. So uh, training on how to conduct a screening, where to refer families for screenings, um, the requirements of your funding stream around screenings um, and licensing standards. Um, and I've already talked a little bit about uh, difficult conversations. 
Um, and also knowing about your community resources so that if you do a screening or even if you can't do a screening, you know, where to send a family to get one. In Accelerate, which is uh, Illinois Quality Rating Improvement System, there are requirements at different levels for screenings and they also have online resources and guides on how to do screenings or where to access them. And so another best practice within developmental screening is that providers can actually be part of the process from beginning to end. So if you can't do screenings within your program, um, it's about knowing where to refer the family, um, either to your Child and Family Connections or your LEA or even the pediatrician's office. And if you have to refer the family to another place, it's really best practice to follow up with that family. You know, ask how it went, how they were treated, what, half, what was the result of the screening. Um, providers can help families request evaluations and they can really uh, provide a lot of details in different contexts. So we all know that kids act differently in different situations. So they might behave one way at home, they might be a different way at school, and a provider can really provide a lot of um, important information in a different context, in a different setting. Um, providers can also participate in the IFSP and IEP evaluations and also the meetings if the family consents. And if the child qualifies for services, uh, particularly with early intervention, they can actually provide the therapies within the setting and within the program. And providers can, pr and can uh, serve an important role to facilitate communication between any therapist and the families. So I mentioned infant and early childhood mental health consultation, and this is another really great way to address it within your program. So consultation is about building the capacity of the caregivers in a child's life. It's a multi-level, promotional, preventive, and early intervention approach that teams multidisciplinary infant and early childhood mental health professionals with people who work with young children and their families in order to promote children's social-emotional development, health, and well-being. So while infant and early childhood mental health consultants do some level of work directly with kids and families, this is more about building the capacity and assisting the staff within, pro within programs. So this is really a professional development opportunity for staff. Um, and studies have shown that access to infant and early childhood mental health consultation can actually reduce preschool expulsions, improve parent-child relationships, facilitate the development of positive social skills, and support the quality of the workforce by increasing the retention rates of early childhood professionals. It's also been shown to address secondary trauma and reduce high levels of stress of professionals within early care and education programs. And so when looking for an infant and early childhood mental health consultant, it's recommended that they have an advanced degree, uh, a master's degree in child development, so specifically early childhood, social work, counseling, psychology, family or marriage therapy, psychiatry, or nursing. Licensure is optional, so things like an LSW, LCSW, or LPC or LCPC. But you'd want a minimum of five years experience with an infant and early childhood development or mental health. And you'd want these competencies, such as an ability to engage in reflective practice and maintain a consultative stance and know how to consult with a program, a knowledge of early childhood development, mental health, and early care and education, an ability to build relationships and collaboratively engage with families, providers, programs, and systems, an ability to work effectively through diverse cultures and communities, ability to effectively and sensitively gather information, an ability to collaboratively develop a plan and shared measures of success, a knowledge of community systems and resources, and the ability to develop partnerships, and a commitment to ethical behavior and reflective practice. And so what does a consultant do? And so typical tasks and strategies would be things like using reflective case consultation to support program staff in addressing the significant needs of children and families, provide training and education opportunities to parents and staff on relevant topics related to child mental health, um, child development, guidance and discipline, support for children with special needs, uh, self-care, and among other topics. They would support the program in developing, developing and implementing protocols for social-emotional screening. They could conduct general classroom or home, observation, home visit observations and other appropriate methods for identifying kids in need of mental health support. They could work closely with program staff to identify children in need of individual observation and referral. And this observation could be triggered by a score from a social emotional screening or just concerns from teachers or the parent or the guardian. Um, but individual observations would require parental consent. 
Uh, a consultant could provide support and education to parents to determine if a referral is appropriate for their child and to navigate the process. Individual consultation to kids or parents as a bridge to long-term mental health services could happen. A consultant could also assist with parental depression screenings, family engagement, and family assessments, and then finally assist staff in knowledge of community resources. Um, and so I think what's important to mention here is that uh, consultants are available to programs statewide, and it really is kind of up to the individual program to determine how they utilize their consultant. And some only call them in you know, when there's a crisis or a specific need, um, but if you're really wanting to effectively use them in a, on a preventive level, you would want to um, start using your consultant from, you know, day one and with all of these kind of preventive activities to help plan throughout the, the year. So currently in Illinois, there are some statewide initiatives and legislation that have a focus on infant and early childhood mental health. Uh, the first is the Mental Health Consultation Initiative that is being coordinated by the Illinois Children's Mental Health Partnership in partnership with numerous public and private stakeholders. So it's a multi-year expansion initiative that advances the goal of a universal, effective, and sustainable infant and early childhood mental health consultation model within Illinois with an expanded qualified workforce. So it began in September 2015, and phase one included conducting a scan of the current infant and early childhood mental health consultation workforce and assessing the readiness of the workforce across systems to provide increased services. It developed a leadership team and a theory of change, and it developed a shared vision and articulation of a model that would be flexible enough to work within multiple systems, better support caregivers, young children and their families, and ultimately lead to better outcomes for kids, families, and the programs serving them. Phase two of the project then uh, involved the development of a workforce development plan that would support the current consultant workforce, as well as create pathways for expansion and diversifying the workforce, and also planning for a pilot project of the model. And so phase three will begin in October of this year, and that will include implementation and evaluation of the pilot project. And so the pilot will consist of intervention and control sites within four communities in Illinois, two urban and two rural. And it will be in three infant and early childhood systems, home visiting that are programs that are not currently receiving consultation, um, center-based child care settings, and then ISBE and DFSS, DFSS early care and education settings. Um, the comparison communities will involve the same three systems in two community, communities, and so a total of 24 sites will be involved. Another statewide initiative that I've just briefly mentioned is the Illinois Association for Infant Mental Health development of a bachelor's level credential. So we've already talked about the master's level credential that they have, which is a year-long relationship-based professional development process that's designed to deepen and strengthen the knowledge and skills of the experienced practitioner. And of the master's level, uh, the sixth cohort is actually starting this fall. Um, but currently, the association is working on developing a bachelor's level credential in order to endorse other types of early childhood staff, such as home visitors, directors, family support workers, and teachers. And so that's not available yet, but it is on the horizon. And then we've already talked about the pyramid model, uh, but there's actually in Illinois a pyramid model statewide initiative um, where Illinois has officially become a pyramid model state, and we're working with the pyramid model consortium on a national level. And so this effort is being coordinated by the Governor's Office of Early Childhood Development, and there's a statewide leadership group composed of state agencies and public and private partners, and there have been some initial trainings on the pyramid model. And so here's some state and federal legislation that I want to talk about. Um, first, we have Public Act 100-105. Um, which was previously known as HB 2663. This was signed into law in August, and it is the early childhood expulsion legislation. It goes into effect on January 1st, 2018, and it prohibits the expulsion of children from early childhood education programs that receive Illinois State Board of Education grants or programs that are licensed by the Department of Children and Family Services. So this law would apply to school and community-based programs receiving early childhood block grant funds, so preschool for all and preschool and prevention initiatives, and then also licensed child care providers serving kids zero to age five. The legislation sets forth a, forth a process to ensure that removal is not the first or only option explored. 
It clarifies that available resources, services, and interventions must be utilized and that parents must also be engaged at all points of the process. Um, and nothing in the bill precludes a parent or guardian's right to voluntarily withdraw their child from a program. And a provider can still transition a child with challenging behavior from their program only after they have documented that they have tried to meet the child's needs. So providers have to help families plan for the child's transition to a more appropriate setting. So this planned transition process is not considered an expulsion. Um, part of the, the legislation it, that we wanted to highlight was that um, it's not saying that every child has to stay in every program. It may not be a good fit. Basically, it's just outlining a process that has to happen before that uh, goes into effect, and it has to be a planned transition with uh, the parent's input and, and uh, consent. Providers will also have to report data related to transition. Um, and also a few other caveats to the legislation that if there's a serious safety threat to the child or to others, so other kids or, or the staff, the temporary removal of a child from attendance in the group settings can still be used. But the clarification is that the child must be returned to the group setting as quickly as safety will allow and that the same resources, services, and interventions must be called upon. The legislation also asks that the state agencies, so uh, the State Board of Ed and DCFS, to identify and make available trainings and topics needed to address the problem, as well as strengthen data collection and dissemination around the issue. And so right now, uh, DCFS and ISBE, in collaboration with the Governor's Office of Early Childhood and the Department of Human Services, are going to adopt administrative rules that will specify implementation and monitoring requirements. And so. Um, they're working to develop the data reporting and collection process, and then also advocacy organizations like the OUNCE and Action for Children um, and Voices are still continuing to spread the word about the legislation, as well as opportunities to connect resources to providers and identifying additional ways to support the providers. The next piece of legislation is 9997, and that was signed um, into effect January 2017. And this requires an age and developmentally appropriate social and emotional screening to be included as part of the examinations and procedures that constitute a health examination under the school health form in public school. And so this sets forth requirements with respect to the rules concerning social and emotional screening. And it asks that information be shared in a manner consistent with laws and policies governing healthcare confidentiality. So every child will now present proof of development of a developmental and social emotional screening on the school health form. Um, but the important thing to realize with this legislation is that the failure to obtain the screening can't be used to exclude a child from attending school. Um, if proof of the screening is not submitted, then the school can offer the screening with parental consent. And if the screening, if proof of screening is submitted, the school can then also make available the appropriate school personnel to work with the parent, the child, and the provider to obtain evalu appropriate evaluation and services. And so right now, uh, in this process, the Department of Public Health is developing the rules and revisions to the health exam form um, to, and, and is also working with specified partners to make recommendations on validated screening tools. So those are two statewide pieces of legislation, but at the federal level, uh, we also have the Trauma-Informed Care for Children and Families Act of 2017. And this was introduced by Senator Durbin and Representative Davis with the hope that this will improve training and coordination so that more children who have experienced trauma are identified and supported with the right care. And so this piece of legislation would create a federal task force to establish best practices for identifying and providing support to kids who have experienced trauma, provide teachers, doctors, social service providers, and first responders with the tools and understanding to help kids who have experienced trauma by allowing for funding for, several, for federal grant programs to be used for this training. It would also expand Medicaid coverage for child trauma services, increase mental health care in schools, and enlist trained mentors and community leaders to help. It would expand loan repayment and graduate school behavioral health training programs and enhance teacher training programs. And it would create a grant program to bring together stakeholders to identify needs, collect data, and target efforts, and allow communities to pool federal grants from multiple agencies and focus the funding on increasing trauma services for children. And so this piece of legislation is still in consideration. It's being debated in both chambers. It's been referred to committee in the Senate and sent to a subcommittee in the House. 
And so just to kind of wrap up a little bit, I wanted to list a bunch of resources. Um, I'm going to go through these pretty quickly so we can get to the questions. Um, all of these are in your handout, so if you are trying to write them down, don't worry, you can get them from the handout. Um, but we have a few here on some of the things I've talked about, like the pyramid model, um, the organization Zero to Three and NACI have a lot of information for infant and early childhood mental health. And then locally within Illinois, the State Board of Education actually has uh, topics pages that have a lot of good information. And then Town Square is an online resource portal for child care providers that has webinars and modules that are linked to the Gateways and um, INCRA system. Specific to infant and early childhood mental health consultation, the child care resource and referral agencies provide mental health cons consultants as well as infant toddler specialists to child care providers and also training. And then ISBE, while they don't endorse a specific consultant, they do maintain a list of available consultants on their website. And then at a federal level, the Substance Abuse and Mental Health Substance Administration has their Center of Excellence for consultation, and Head Start also has a learning module around mental health consultation. These resources are specific to developmental screening. We have Birth to Five, Watch Me Thrive, which is a federal website. And then the Child Find Project is specific to Illinois, and it offers public awareness materials on developmental screenings and referrals, as well as information on data collected within Illinois. And then Accelerate Illinois has uh, training ma uh, materials and guidelines around uh, how to conduct screenings or where to send a family to get a screening. And then within Illinois, we also have the Early Childhood Center of Professional Development for preschool for all and prevention initiative staff. Um, Illinois StarNet provides training and TA for the early care and education workforce with a fo focus on children birth to age eight with special needs. Um, and Early Choices, also through the State Board of Ed, um, is a preschool least restrictive environment initiative that promotes high quality inclusive environments. Uh, the Ounce of Prevention has professional development opportunities for home visitors, teaching staff, and mental health consultants. And the Erickson Institute has graduate education programs and continuing education programs. And they also have the Fussy Baby Network and partnerships with schools. We also have the Illinois Association for Infant Mental Health, which I've talked about, and anyone interested in infant mental health can join. You don't have to be a consultant or a, or a therapist. Um, and like I said, they have the master's level credential and are developing the bachelor's, bachelor's level. They have their annual conference, and then they also have the reflective practice groups. The Illinois Children's Mental Health Partnership uh, provides the consultation to the McV Home Visiting Programs in Illinois, and they're also the ones who are currently leading the Mental Health Consultation Initiative. And then the Illinois Childhood Trauma Coalition has the Look Through Their Eyes campaign about childhood trauma that has videos and handouts. These next resources particularly focus on expulsion and suspension, cultural humility and competence, and anti-racism training. Um, and so the Transforming School Discipline Collaborative and Crossroads Anti-Racism Organizing and Training, those are both Illinois organizations and the other ones are national organizations. And so here's my contact information that's also available to you. Um, so feel free if you think later you can ask questions if we don't get to them. Um, and then also now you can uh, put in your questions and we can have some time for that. And then Edna mentioned, um, if we're not able to get to all of your questions, we'll compile those and send those out. Um, so I'm going to kick this back over to Edna to facilitate our questions. Hi, Allie. So thank you so much. I think right now the one question that has come in, um, if it's possible for you to answer, is um, can you talk about best practices and alternatives to suspension expulsion that work? I can. Um, that presentation is one that I have actually done quite often. Um, and I've done it the shortest I've done it in is, is in about 30 minutes, and the longest I've done it in is, is in three hours. So it's a very uh, detailed and nuanced topic that I love talking about. 
Um, and so actually last week, uh, Action for Children and the Ounce Prevention did a presentation just specifically related to expulsion and suspension um, and where we went over some best practices. And, and a lot of them are pretty much what I've mentioned already here. It's a lot about a tiered system of support, um, mental health consultation, developmental screening, family engagement. Um, one thing that I do get into a lot in talking about best practices with that is the implicit bias piece and having your program address that and be reflective as a staff. Um, that is a sticky point of conversation that a lot of people don't feel comfortable talking about, and so that one can be tricky, um, but I still think that it's an important one to address. Um, my suggestion, because we don't have a lot of time here today, um, what we can do is probably address this question more fully after the presentation when we kind of email out resources, and I believe, Edna, um, the presentation that we did last week is, is available. Is that correct? Correct. It uh, will be posted on the Illinois Action for Children uh, website, and so we can send that link around um, afterwards. Great. Thank you. Okay. So um, at this time, uh, once again, we would like to thank Allison for um, sharing your insights and expertise with us this afternoon. Um, and in addition to the resources that um, Allison sh uh, shared, um, we would like to um, call your attention to an upcoming event that Illinois Action for Children is hosting. Um, we have a free um, symposium taking place um, on Saturday, October 7th in Chicago um, titled, you know, uh, We Are Stronger Than What We Know, Children's Emotional Well-Being and Mental Health Symposium. Um, this is a free um, symposium and it really provides a lot of great opportunities to discuss and explore the issues, to learn about strategies, to network, um, and there are um, workshops available um, in Spanish as well. And the bonus is that um, these workshops are also available for gateway credits. So please remember to oops, register. Let me show that uh, link again. Uh, if you go to um, actforchildren.org, slash events, you will be um, sent to the registration link and feel free to share that with other colleagues. So before we check out for uh, today, if uh, I can invite you for one uh, more uh, poll on a scale of one to five, we'd like to know how valuable your participation was on today's webinar. Um, not valuable slightly, moderate valuable, or very valuable. So at this time, we will launch the poll. And if you can go ahead and just submit your um, answer. We really appreciate um, your feedback and your participation on today's webinar. Um, we would like to um, thank you for your time today and also um, to let you know that this webinar once again was recorded and the PowerPoint presentation will be available on the Partner Plan Act website. This uh, webinar was made possible through the generous support of the Grand Victoria Foundation. Thanks again for your participation, and this concludes today's webinar. Thanks, Anna. Thank you, Allie.